Well, hello there, ladies and gents. Welcome along again. Back to Norway. I say back, I haven't left yet. But the Norway adventure is now over. And thanks to a last minute ferry cancellation, I have got a massive ride ahead of me. Beeline is telling me I'm looking at a seven hour ride time because my ferry from Larvik was canceled and moved to Christian Sands. Literally hours before I'm supposed to uh, get to where I'm staying for the night so I can catch a ferry in the morning. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. The adventure was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. There was a lot of disappointment, but ultimately still did exactly what I was hoping it would do. I got the bike in the dirt, got to make some use of the knobbly tires I've got on. But I thought, as I've got this massive long ride, you lot can keep me company. And I'll have a little word with you about all of the gear that I've been using on this trip, as well as giving you the chance to take in some more of the incredible Norwegian countryside. So get yourself comfy, it's going to be a long one, hopefully not so long for you, but for me, it's definitely going to be a long one. Although I'm going to have to see if I can't shave a few hours off of the seven hour arriving time, that's ridiculous. Well obviously the first thing, the first big star of the show, the first item I'm going to have to talk about is the bike, isn't it? This is a 2018 KTM 1090 Adventure S. This is the road version. So that means non-adjustable front suspension and cast wheels. But quite simply put, the bike has been epic. It's been just fantastic. Yeah, I know the riding has been slightly different, but I can put a pretty good contrast the experience with how it was riding the Honda CV 1000R because I was in Norway last year with my stepdad here. Had a truly tremendous two-week trip and we were keeping the daily distances down to about 250 maximum 300 kilometers and despite that by the end of the trip I was absolutely in tatters. Every part of my body ached, I was tired. By the end of it I'll be honest that trip was kind of the catalyst and the final blow if you like that made me get rid of that bike and buy this one. But in complete contrast to that, this bike, even on days that didn't turn out as I'd hoped and ended up being epically long, amazingly, by the end of the day, I wasn't broken. I still felt okay. I mean, I was mentally tired, obviously, but I had no aches, no pains. My ass didn't hurt. My shoulders weren't stiff. It was a revelation, quite frankly. The bike was enjoyable and fun and comfortable to ride all day long. Which comes to the next bit, the enjoyment factor. I've been wrestling against buying into the adventure bike hype for so long because it seems like every Tom, Dick and his dog has got one. But now I get it. I really do get it. Long, long gone are the days when adventure bikes have to be immensely heavy, lumbering in the corners, slow on the uptake, because this thing is an absolute weapon. It's been nothing but an absolute pleasure to ride. I've really been banging it around in the twisties on the tarmac. I felt, considering my experience level, pretty comfortable on the off-road bits. And all the while, the bike has been uh, not wanting to jinx it when I've still got 400 k's to travel today and then another 500 tomorrow. But it's been absolutely amazing. But it, it hasn't skipped a beat. The thing has started every time. It's given me great fuel economy. Even on the off-roady days, I'm still getting between 5 and 5.3 litres per 100 kilometres. What that is in MPG, I'll stick up on the screen because I can't do the maths that quick. The thing I've been loving the absolute most is the motor. I don't know how I've lived my life this long without having a KTM LCA engine. The thing is a peach. The thing just pushes, barks like a mad creature when you give it the beans, but then happily hums along at cruising speed with, amazingly, way less vibrations than I was used to on the CB1000R, my old Honda. When that bike was smooth, typically Honda smooth, but it just had this annoying buzz when you were cruising, which made it tiring. Whereas this one, it's just a gentle thrum all the time, just reminding you that it's there. Zero vibrations practically in the handlebars. I've had no numb hands, numb fingers, all things that I did experience with the Honda. The massive tank's been a bonus, 23 litres, it's gonna get me, it's telling me 430 kilometres. Obviously that's always a little bit optimistic, but it's never that far off. You know, already so far on this ride, 4.6 litres per 100 kilometres, that's impressive. It's as impressive as the death wish that that squirrel had. Can't say that he didn't hear me coming. The lack of adjustment on the suspension on the front of this bike has been, quite simply, a non-issue. It just wasn't a problem. I didn't even think about it. The bike just did its suspending and kept me going. Had no issues whatsoever. Always felt that the front was planted. Always had good feel. 
never felt that the suspension was holding me back. And the rear again, haven't touched the adjustments at all since I bought the bike to be fair, and it's just always doing the job, just fine. And still doing the job, way better than the stock shocker did on the Honda. That thing was a disaster. Right, I'm gonna stop making this into a comparison between KTM and the Honda. That's not what the video is about. Creature comforts on this bike, I've also got the KTM Power Parts Ergo heated seat. That was a godsend. I've also got heated grips, which again, indispensable. I didn't have heated grips last year and I really missed them. Even just on days where the sun disappears and the temperatures are in the low double digits, having the ability to warm your hands on the inside is just a massive bonus. So yeah, the bike is a winner. I have loved every moment of riding this thing. And in every single different scenario, it has performed fantastically. Super flickable and handles great in the bendies on the tarmac. Light enough for me, off-road amateur, to chuck it around a bit in the off-road. Also, light enough that it wasn't hernia creating torture to lift the thing up when I dropped it on the floor a few times. I didn't even have to take the luggage off. Although on that subject, I have actually stripped off a bunch of bits and bobs from this bike. I managed to drop the weight from stock by 12 kilos. And I think that's obviously played a big part with regards to the ease of changing direction in the twisties and with picking it up in the dirt. For more details on what I did to the bike, check out the other video in which I documented all of the stuff that I took off, sometimes threw in the bin, sometimes saved for later. So yeah, KTM 1090 Adventure, definitely the right choice for this adventure. I've used the word adventure too many times, I need to be a bit more adventurous with my vocabulary. I mean, the question can be asked, should I maybe have gone for the R version? Perhaps maybe I should, especially if I want to do more of this off-road lark and uh, maybe get a bit more extreme. The spoked wheels and the upgraded suspension will of course make a hell of a difference, but for now this is definitely good enough and I am a very, very happy owner. Now that we've reached a nice sweepy bendy bit, I guess the next obvious thing on the list is the tyres. And I will prefix this section by saying that I have zero experience before this trip with off-road tyres. Never had to buy them, I've never had to use them. And I spent a long time going through various reviews and options, considered the Mitas E07 Plus, I considered the Michelin Anarchy Wild, considered the Heidenau Rangers, and in the end I settled upon the Bridgestone AX41 Adventure Cross tyres. Seemed like a very good balance between impressive meaty off-road performance and relatively good, bearing in mind they're knobbly tyres, on-road performance. And I have to say, I'm really happy that I made that choice. I found chucking the bike around in the twisties, the tyres definitely aren't holding me back. It took a little while to get used to the fact that because they're bias ply tyres, they flex and move in a very different way, i.e. barely at all, compared to radial ply tyres. And as a result, they tip in a bit weirdly, as in they don't really want to. Changes of input when you're in the middle of a corner can sometimes give you a tiny little bit of a shimmy and you can feel a bit of extra flex when you're on the sides on the shoulders because obviously you're on those tall rubbery nobbles. But once you get used to those eccentricities, shall we call them, found them to be really good. I've been bunging this bike in and out the corners, I don't know, probably 80 to 90% as enthusiastically as I would on road tires. All without any real ill effects, I haven't had any slips. Sometimes when I pushed it a little bit too hard, you get a tiny bit of a squirm, but in the dry, they've been tip top. They're definitely very capable of dealing with the tarmac bits in between your off-road sections, and in no way affecting your enjoyment of those tarmac sections. I have noticed a few times when I've really given it the beans on the right hand, the traction control light comes on a lot more often than it normally does with the road tyres. So the back end does struggle a tiny bit for the traction when you're really giving it the rinses coming out of a long sweeper. Whereas at the other end, I've had no issues under hard braking coming into hairpins and things. I haven't felt the ABS kick in at all on the front end, not even in the wet last night. And my experience with it off-road, I didn't do as much off-road on this trip as I had hoped for, but I did get to do a fair bit. And again, I was actually really impressed and I totally do not regret this choice. There were some pretty sloppy bits. There were some very sandy bits. There were some really loose gravelly bits. And for a newbie, I felt pretty confident the whole time. It really did feel like the tires were doing their job. And I'm gonna be completely honest, probably taking up a fair bit of the slack for my lack of experience. I was riding in conditions that might have gone there with my supposedly adventure tires. Metzler Tourant's next that were on this bike when I got it. I'd have been on my ass in seconds. Whereas with these knobbly suckers on, everything felt within my grasp.
folks. But yeah, all in all, the Bridgestone AX41s allowed me to tick all the boxes that I'd hoped to tick. They let me connect up the off-road bits, but enjoy the riding while I was doing it and not feeling like I had to nurse these off-road tires around on the tarmac. And then when things got messy, it kept me so I was feeling comfortable. I mean, I'm no Dakar rally rider, so I wasn't exactly pushing the limits. Obviously, it's not all positives. They are quite noisy. I'll just crack my visor, pull in the clutch. hear that they've got that sort of tractor whine although to be fair not as loud as I expected it to be with the, the state of the knobliness but in any case I've got earplugs in and it, it just doesn't bother me also all of that road grip that I appear to have obviously comes as a result of what must be quite a soft compound and as a result these tires are wearing incredibly fast to the point where I'm pretty sure by the time I get home they're still going to have a little bit of meat on them enough to be legal but whether they're going to be functional off-road there's going to be a lot less biting meat. In their defence I will say that a lot more of this trip has been on-road than I had hoped. Now obviously if you lived a lot closer to the twisties and you wanted a tyre that was going to really provide the goods and you didn't have to cover thousands of miles of tarmac just to get to the trails then this tyre is probably a really good choice and you're probably going to get a shed load more mileage out of it without wearing them out of the tarmac because it seems like as soon as you get on this stuff it's just game over. Even after the first run on the motorway when I went down to an ADV training day that I did, I could visibly see that they've worn after the first 500 kilometers. But again, that was mostly tarmac, sadly. But with that being said, of all of the tires that I did look at, the Bridgestones were actually the cheapest. I managed to get the pair for 235 euros delivered, and then it cost me another 40 to get them fitted. And at the time, even the Mitas EO7 Pluses were coming in at 250 the pair. Look, you probably could have done with one of them yesterday. Right, up next, while I'm looking here at the front of the bike, I want to go with navigation. I've been using the Beeline Moto, which, to be fair, actually surprised me a bit. I've been having a bit of a falling in and out of love with the thing ever since I got it. It seems like in cities, at junctions where there's more than two options, it becomes a bit difficult and it's sometimes hard to read and you can very quickly get lost. Whereas when you're out in the middle of nowhere and you come to a junction, there's literally two options, left or right. This thing is infallible. It works every time and I've actually found it to be quite reliable on this trip. Possibly the most reliable it's been of ever, except for one thing, I think three times, maybe four, when I missed a turn, I've left it so that the auto recalculate was off so that I would know that I've missed the turn and I can go back and get on the correct trail before it recalculates the text somewhere else. But a few times when I've done that, it would tell me I'm going the wrong way for a couple hundred meters and then just crash. But the problem is because it was crashed, you couldn't then turn off the unit, turn it back on again. I would have to stop, get the phone out, end the route and then start the route again and then it would start up and that was really really frustrating almost as much as camper vans on the s-bends otherwise battery life amazing i charged it up once during this whole tour uh, i've actually got it mounted on the brand name on there is van risel which is a quick lock cycle computer mount that i bought from decathlon and that's quite cool because it means it's bounced a bit higher up, a bit further away from the bars, a bit more visible around the clock so I don't have to keep looking down at the bars. There is an elephant in the room and that is the fact that I've got a phone on the handlebars. I've only just put this on today because due to the, the ferry cancellation and me having to put together a new route and wanting to be able to see exactly what's going on on the map while I'm riding. Otherwise, I wouldn't use that at all. So just ignore it. That's, it's not there. In case you did care, it's mounted on with the Insta360 motorcycle mount clamp tiny little ram arm that used to hold my Garmin on and a Ulanzi mobile phone holder with a tripod mount. That's when it comes to programming the routes everything is nice and easy. You just choose your start point, choose your end point, tap your waypoints, drag them around, everything works pretty good. You just have to make sure that you're really really accurate with your waypoints because if you get something slightly off or if you do it too zoomed out you accidentally pick what you think is on a road but it turns out it's in somebody's driveway next to the road then the beeline will take you into the driveway. Ask me how I know. That blasty moment makes me think the next thing on the list is going to be the exhaust. Obviously I've got the stock headers, stock catalytic converter, all that stuff still on there. But the end can is a Cobra Exhausts RX-77. What is there to be said? It sounds utterly glorious. You 
It looks good, not too big, not too small, and it also saved a whopping four kilograms off of the weight of the stock exhaust. So another thing I'm very glad that I've had on this trip, providing weight saving and a great soundtrack. And that incidentally was provided to me by Cobra Exhaust, so big thanks to you guys for supporting the channel once again with another one of your great egg cans. Tremendous cacophony of joy. So next up, another thing that I'm looking at right in front of me, well, part of it at least, is the Scott Euler E-System. This too was provided to me by Scott Euler. It's the same unit, literally the exact same unit, that I had fitted on the CB1000R, which has been absolutely brilliant because it means when I've been on the road, everything's dry. I can turn the flow rate down to a sensible level, but then when I've been charging through snow, slush, dirt, when it was hammering it down with rain, I could whack the flow rate up without having to mess around with the unit itself, just do it all in the control here, and make sure that the chain is getting enough oil. The oiling itself has been problem free. The chain still has a nice film of oil over the rollers. I mean, after the stuff I've been riding through, the side plates are a bit grotty. They're gonna need a clean, but that doesn't really affect the operation so much. Whereas the rest of the chain, the rollers are nice and clean, nice and oiled and the chain as you can hear is running quietly and despite me having whacked up the flow rate through most of the times that I was riding off-road and on the days when it was hammering it with rain I only actually had to fill up the oiler once so far and even then it was still a quarter full so if we just say extreme case it was full when I left home I filled it up one other time so that's what 2,500 2, kilometers so it's good for 1,250 kilometers on one fill up what is that? That's about seven to 800 miles. I'm a normal use, so obviously I would have got a lot more mileage out of that. And finally, of course, the oil that they have in the oilers now is biodegradable green oil, which means it's not gonna harm the environment. It's not gonna harm the animals out there. And we can use it with a free and clean conscience. Woohoo! That is a device. And then the last thing here on the handlebars, over on the far right here, is the Atlas Throttle Lock. This thing, obviously, in the twisties, in the off-road sections, not really that much use. But on the bits in between, where it's long, straight and boring, it's absolutely brilliant. This bike, the 2018 1090 Adventure, is much like my CB1000R was, a throttle-by-wire bike that has no built-in cruise control, which is a crime. Opinion. But anyway, they did it. But that doesn't matter because you can just bolt this thing onto the handlebars, it connects to the throttle, and you just push this lower button, and the throttle is locked. So now I'm running on cruise control, the throttle is in a locked position. It does mean when you go downhill, the bike will accelerate. When you go uphill, the bike will decelerate because it's a fixed throttle position, not a fixed speed. But the good thing is, it's not a solid lock. So when I go uphill, I can actually finally adjust, get a little bit more throttle, and it stays where that is. You can do the same by letting a little bit off and that stays again wherever you let go. This is the latest version which actually has a vastly improved friction pad system. It's far less fiddly to install and far more effective than the last system, even though the last system was already pretty good. But this one, no sticky pads needed, just connects together, everything works great. And then when you're done, when it gets twisty, push the X on the top, the throttle is now free again. So yeah, a real lifesaver for the crampy right wrists on the long motorway stretches and the straight boring bits in between the bends. Full metal construction, really well made. A simple product executed really, really well. Also provided to me by Atlas Throttle Lock, so thanks to you guys for supporting the channel. And thanks for getting this one to me quickly and in time for this trip. I literally installed this throttle lock onto my bike three hours before I left to catch my ferry. And I'm really glad that I did. So with all the technical stuff taken care of, we come on to the luggage. As you may well have noticed, I've gone for a very minimal luggage setup. I've got no tank bag, I've got no tail pack. As you can see, hiding behind me on my left there, I've got one pannier on the left side, one pannier on the right side. And these are the Hepco and Becker X Travel Basic Bags, which are mounted through the use of adapter plates onto the Hepco and Becker cutout luggage racks. Now, the cutout luggage racks are normally meant for the cutout Explorer aluminium bins, but because there was off-road involved on this trip, I opted to not bring those so that should the worst happen, I wouldn't find myself pinned to the ground by a hard cornered aluminium box. Instead, I'd have a nice, soft, comfy bag pinning me to the floor. 
Plus there's the added bonus that using the soft bags over the aluminium bins means I save about six kilograms in weight. And every little helps when you need to be picking it up off the floor on the edge of a wet, sloppy, snow-covered trail. These bags are 35 litres each, completely waterproof, which I can confirm, having been through several days of rain and having chucked them in a couple of puddles. Not a single thing has gotten even slightly damp inside. They have a really cool mounting mechanism where you hook these little aluminium buckles in at the top and then wrap the straps through the holes and hook them in at the bottom. Sounds fiddly. Once you've done it once or twice, you can do it with your eyes closed. In fact, quite often, I had to do the hooking underneath without even seeing what I was doing, but it was really quite easy. Here with the aid of upskirt cam, you can see exactly what I mean. And on the whole, the bags have been absolutely brilliant. They've got plenty of space. They've got these handy little flap out pouches at the front where you can stick any extra stuff in that you want to get out a bit more quickly without undoing the roll top. But also because of the way they work with essentially two straps going all the way around the bag, if the bag isn't full, it compresses itself together, takes up the slack, and you haven't got a baggy bag flapping around in the wind. Which is good because for most of this trip, mine weren't full. I didn't wear any of my thermal gear, I didn't wear any of my heated gear on the way up and then after the first few days realised that it was friggin freezing up here and then suddenly the bags were half empty. Also, I brought a whole bunch of pot noodles and cup of soups and snack bars and things with me which over the course of the week I've been eating so gradually the bags have become more and more empty and then they just squash down with the strap mechanism which was great. My only criticism is the buckles that hold it all together they could do with hooking into the straps just a little bit better. In fact, on one occasion when I dropped the bike on the floor one of the buckles popped out. Not such a big deal. Hopefully they're not going to end up on the floor too often. But also with me being a bit OCD, making sure that stuff goes on tight, I've actually managed to bend one of the buckles very slightly by cranking on the strap too much. They've also got the Molly strap system on the front and the back, which I didn't actually use because I had so much space. But if I'd needed to, I could have connected my pouches that had my tool kit and all my cables and stuff onto the outside. And then the carrying handles on the top make it very easy to carry the bags into your hotel or your cabin or your campsite or whatever. Although, as an upgrade, I would have really liked to have seen a shoulder strap. But yeah, otherwise, really happy with those bags. They've served me very, very well, and I will happily be using them again. Once again, that setup was also provided by Hepco and Becker, so huge thanks to you guys at Hepco and Becker for supporting the channel too. Oh yeah, and while we're on the subject of Hepco and Becker, the engine bars on the sides are also Hepco and Becker, and I've dropped the bike twice on this trip. Once at a standstill, once at probably, I don't know, jogging pace, and both times the bars have done their job perfectly. No damage whatsoever to the bike, and because there was no tarmac involved, no damage to the bars themselves either. Plus, they also saved a half a kilo on the stock engine bars. Picking hairs, but it all adds up together. I never thought I'd say it, but it's so nice to see that all of the fjords aren't frozen here and seeing frozen lakes as far as the eye can see for the last week. It was brass monkeys. Oh, another liquid lake. Heaven. Anyway, that really is now all of the technical stuff, all of the equipment strapped to the bike finished. So we move on to me. We'll start with the stuff that you can't see. Underneath, I've got a set of Rucker Outlast thermal trousers. Absolutely brilliant stuff. I've got the top that matches that as well. It somehow manages to regulate your climate by absorbing heat when you're over hot and then giving it back to you when you get cold. It's magic, it actually works, I just don't know how. Underneath that as well, I've also got the Knox base layer, which is nothing short of brilliant. The thing is incredibly comfortable, really soft, does a great job of wecking, wecking? There'll be no wecking here, thank you very much. Does a great job of wicking your sweat away. When it gets wet, it dries within, it feels like minutes. The thing has some kind of silver thread that stops it from ever smelling. I've been wearing the thing all week long, every night, just give it a rinse under the sink, hang it over the back of a chair, by the next day it's completely dry and the thing still smells as fresh as a daisy. On top of that I've got a bog standard micro fleece jumper that you can buy everywhere and anywhere. And then over all of that I'm wearing the Rucker Calavesi Gore-Tex Pro laminated suit, which is quite frankly nothing short of brilliant. It's got more vents than you can shake a breezy stick at, except for the ones on the back, all very easily accessible. Got a vent all the way down the side, it's got a vent under the armpit, it's got two vents on the front, and then two down the back. The pockets are all waterproof. It's got a built-in storm collar, which I've had out several times when the weather's been particularly shit. It's also got double cuffs to keep the water and the wind out, 
and lots of different adjustments and things on the sleeves to make sure the fit is right. It also normally has Outlast thermal liners for the top and the bottom, which again, when they're doubled up with the uh, Outlast underlayer that I've also got, the result is fantastic. I've been out on this jacket on 25 degree days with the thermal liners in and the vents open and been perfectly comfortable. And then later on when the sun goes down, whip the vents up and I'm nice and cozy when it's dark and cold. As a complete setup, it really is infallible. It's bloody expensive, but it is bloody good. Plus, it comes with a full set of armor, including chest armor, and everything except for the chest and the back is level two. But I've also upgraded the back to a level two. It cost me 70 euros, I think. They're all D3O in partnership with Rucker. They're super light because they've got kind of like this mesh design. So there's lots of air pockets in it, which also mean the air can flow through when you're venting. And the pads are massive. They're bigger by, I would say, at least 25% than any other pads I've ever had in any other biker gear since I started riding bikes nearly 20 years ago. But possibly best of all, when you're on a trip like this, when it absolutely tonked it down with rain all day long, I hung the jacket and the trousers up in my room and by morning everything was completely bone dry which really is the biggest bonus i think of laminated stuff it just dries so quickly because the fabric doesn't soak in so much water as the two layered stuff does plus as well being gore-tex never get clammy underneath never feel sweaty it's just brilliant it's just amazing i really do think it's one of those products that is worth the money getting good gore-tex laminated gear I can't recommend it enough. Since I've had this suit, my enjoyment of touring has just exponentially increased because it's just one less worry you've got. When it starts to rain, zip up your vents, keep going. When it gets hot, unzip your vents, keep going. I mean, basically, the core principle is just keep going. And then you know everything's going to dry nice and quick when you're done, rather than climbing the next day into a wet fish of a suit to go and ride through another day, potentially of more rain, Nobody wants it. Nobody wants it at all. Then at the ends of the extremities, I've got the Rucker Argosaurus 2.0 gloves. And I really like these gloves, actually. Full leather construction. Obviously Gore-Tex as well, just like everything else. My hands have actually stayed dry for the entire trip. This is one of those cases where it's a waterproof glove that actually does what it says, and my hands have stayed waterproof. And I've had these gloves for over a year now, and they still continue to be waterproof. And if they ever aren't waterproof, they're covered by the Gore-Tex Lifetime Waterproof Guarantee. So I can't possibly lose as far as I'm concerned. Couple that with the fact that they're comfortable, and they've also got a slidey pad on the bottom there to protect the old uh, palm of the hand in the event of a slide along the road. The only negative I have for these gloves, which you could put some of the blame onto me, I suppose, is because they're over a year old now, the leather isn't necessarily the most waterproof anymore, and the water used to bead off the leather and then just run away. So now when it rains really heavily, the leather actually soaks the water up, which means that although my hands stay dry because of the Gore-Tex, they feel colder because the fabric of the gloves is actually completely saturated. Of course, all I really need to do to remedy that is to retreat the leather to make it waterproof again. Probably even with some boot polish, I don't know. Need to read into that to make sure I don't clog up the Gore-Tex. But that leather absorbing the water thing is also a bit of an issue when it gets cold and I use the heated grips, which was also the case with the heated seat. Using a heated seat or heated grips with Gore-Tex garments when it's shitting it down with rain for a prolonged period can sometimes cause the heat to push the water back into the Gore-Tex and then that means you get wet. So when I was on a long cold ride the other day, in the wet, raining for hours and hours, my hands did get a tiny little bit clammy and my bum did get a tiny bit damped where the heated seat was pushing the, the water back through. But in both those cases, I think the situation really called for the heated gear, which would have kept me warm from the inside out rather than from the outside in and would have eliminated those problems altogether. Which very conveniently leads me to the heated gear I had on this trip not using it now because we're now looking at balmy 16.5 degrees, almost the warmest it's been on this trip. But yeah, I have been using the Kais heated vest and the heated gloves. And to be honest, when I was riding through Jutenheim National Park, it was a lifesaver. Without that stuff, I would have quite simply died. I mean, the vest is nothing short of magical. It gives you shed loads of heat instantly the second you turn it on. Also helped by the fact that because I've got the rucksack on here, it was being pressed against my body and that thing kept my core nice and toasty, which in turn kept my arms and helped to keep my hands warm. And in combination with the heated seat, 
meant I was roasty toasty despite the minus two degree temperatures. My only criticism of the vest is that it only heats kind of this area from upper chest to probably bottom of the rib cage. It would be really nice if it would warm underneath a little bit because it's, you know what it's like when you've had a nice cup of warm soup and you can feel it in your belly, just warms you all the way through, doesn't it? Whereas up here on your rib cage, you just, it's heating your lungs, I suppose it's heating your heart as well. Oh, look at this. There is a bit of gravel after all. Just when I thought that that was it for the off-road for this trip, the last little bit of life out of these knobblies. Now the heated gloves is a slightly different story. I mean, they were good. My hands were warm in combination with the heated grips. I can't honestly complain. But unlike the heated grips, the gloves provide kind of a very really gentle warming. Whereas the vest instantly blasts you with heat, the gloves are more of an absence of cold than a presence of heat. And also, we've had the gloves for over a year now, and sadly the cables that connect the gloves to the jacket have stopped working. The, uh, the wire underneath is just broken. There's no connection anymore. Started off with a very shaky contact. The lights would flash and then go off and then flash again. I've remedied that quite simply by using the cable that you would normally connect the gloves directly to the bike with. I just connect that to the jacket and then split the Y, one to each glove, and that works fine. And it also means I've now got loads of extra cable. So when I'm fueling up in the cold, I can have my gloves dangling around like a pair of idiot mittens and look proper stupid. But it also means it's easier to plug them in and to deal with the cable routing and stuff. Whereas before it was always a little bit tight, especially with the double cuffs on the rocker jacket. Well, at the end of the last video, I did actually joke about maybe having a surprise last bit of gravel trackage. Didn't expect it to actually come true though. But yeah, overall, the heated stuff is something I could not have lived without. Just would have been too bloody cold. That's a bit looser. Give it a bit of stand-up action here. And so with the heated gear out of the way, quite fittingly, come to the helmet, which is the Nishua Carbon Enduro. I've had this helmet for quite a few years already. I've always loved it. It's the lightest helmet I've ever owned. It's comfortable, it's airy, I think it looks quite cool. I really love the peak, especially on tours like this, where there's lots of times where you're going to be up early in the morning or finishing off late in the day where the sun's really low and the peak just shades your eyes from the sun blasting into them. So on the whole, still really happy with this helmet. It is showing its age a little bit and I had planned to swap out the pads from the inside. But the problem was the shop where I got this helmet from, Lois, here in Germany, had no stock whatsoever. Just bloody typical, isn't it? As you get into full swing, the batteries die. But I took the opportunity to have a little break. This quite spectacular little lake slash fjord. I don't know what the classification system is. Complete with man and a dog in a boat. Brilliant. Yeah, so I couldn't get any foam pads for the helmet. So I just went with what I've got, which means it's a tiny little bit loose. Something I can look at in the future. Maybe it's time just to replace the helmet altogether. <laughs> anyway. Onwards, as we have only 120 kilometers left till I reach my final stop here in Norway this time round. So try and remember. What else is left? Where was I? Oh yeah, the extremities. Done the hands, the head, so there's the feet. I've got the Italian Guyana Dakar boots. Leather Gore-Tex lined adventure boots with an ankle brace. Direct competition to the City Adventure 2s, which I also considered, but ended up going with these because I thought they were just that little bit cooler. Again, very happy with my choice. Bought these myself, managed to get a great price from Moto Card. I think I paid 240 euros, and they've been really good. I've had no wet feet at all on this trip. They've been comfortable. They've made me feel protected and secure because they go right the way up to the calf, and that ankle brace gave me the confidence to put a foot down here and there without worrying that I was going to twist an ankle. Also, with them being an adventure boot, having a bit of a more meaty sole on them so I knew that I'd have a bit of grip, a bit of traction for my feet if I ever needed to put them down. The only negative point I can think of really is that in the toe area, I quite often ended up with slightly clammy toes, whether it's been hot or cold. It's happened in both extremes and I think that's just because of the reinforced toe box area, probably impeding the function of the Gore-Tex membrane a little bit so the moisture can't get out quite so easily. But to be honest, it's really not that much of a big deal. Slightly clammy toes versus 
completely wet feet, which I ended up with multiple times last year in the Boozer boots as they came to the end of their time. And again, because of the Gore-Tex, protected by the lifetime Gore-Tex waterproof guarantee. Able to walk in them easy enough. Obviously because they're adventure boots, they're pretty stiff, but that's how they're meant to be. Shifting and braking takes a little bit to get used to because the sole is a bit thicker, the boot is a bit stiffer, but as with anything, practice makes perfect and I'm pretty much getting the hang of it now. They supposedly have a shank in the sole, which is supposed to prevent fatigue in the feet when you're standing on the pegs. But I have to say, if there is one, it's not quite as stiff as I expected it to be. And I think that's shown as well by the fact that they are relatively easy to walk in. And that means that when I was stood on the pegs for an extended period of time, my feet did get a little bit tired. Maybe that's just a case of getting used to it, I don't know. Just like the tyres, I've never had ADV boots before, so I've got nothing to compare them against. And I am also talking about when I've been standing on the pegs for hours and hours at a time. Overall, very comfortable. The fact that I just didn't really think about the boots at all shows how good they were doing their job. Again, an expensive bit of kit, much like the suit, but even though I paid for them with my own money, it's a purchase that I'm really satisfied with. And coming to the end now, both of the journey and of the list of equipment I've been using, Another thing that I bought myself, the Krieger Trail 9 Rucksack and Hydration Pack. And again, it's a purchase that I'm really, really happy with because without the tank bag, it meant I had nothing to put my knickknacks, my odds and sods, my batteries, that kind of stuff in. And for that, it's been absolutely perfect. And it's only got a four and a half litre storage capacity in the waterproof compartment. And then I think another four and a half litre compartment where the, the water pouch goes. Incidentally, I don't have Krieger's water pouch. I just got one from Decathlon for 15 euros, a two litre one. And I've been doing all of my battery charging in the backpack while I've been riding. And it's been a real asset on this whole trip. And I've always got water on hand. Two litres is normally enough to last me for most rides. Plus having my extra camera stuff, batteries and that in a waterproof compartment where they're protected from the elements. But most importantly, in a really comfortable way because of this whole um, I've forgotten what it's called now. I'll flash it on the screen. Mine's blank. It's been a long day. But the, the way that it connects the harness across your chest and it spreads the weight across the whole of your upper body rather than just having it on your shoulders means I hardly even know it's there. Another relatively expensive purchase. I think, again, I bought this from Motocard. It cost me 140 euros. But the fact that it works so well and it also comes with Krieger's 10-year guarantee means it's almost definitely going to last me, and if it doesn't, Krieger am definitely going to sort it out for me. I can see this thing coming along with me on a lot more tours in the future, and maybe completely freeing me from the need to have a tank bag at all. I know, crazy times, ladies and boys. But speaking of camera battery charging and the like, that comes to pretty much, I think, the last thing on the whole list of everything that I've been using on this trip, and that is my cameras. If you've watched the series, you'll have noticed that I've kept things relatively simple this time out. There's no 360 action. I've just been relying completely on a matched pair of DJI Osmo Action 3 cameras. Now the first one, the one on my face, was provided to me by DJI, so thanks very much DJI for that. And as great an endorsement as I could possibly give, I was so impressed with it that I bought the second one with my own money. And using them on this tour has been the smoothest, the most reliable, the most problem-free action camera experience I've had in nearly 10 years of running this YouTube channel. The one that DJI gave to me came in the adventure pack fitting, isn't it, I suppose? Which means it came with the three battery charging case. And after I then also bought myself an extra spare battery, which it turns out wasn't entirely necessary, I've been able to run the two cameras from start to empty and then switch out the batteries into the charging case, plug that into the Ugreen power delivery 10,000 milliamp hour battery pack that I've got. And then by the time that next battery is dead, the ones in the charging case are already fully charged. It's absolutely brilliant. And the 10,000 milliamp hour battery pack has been lasting the full day. I've just done a battery swap just then while I was having a break and I've still got about a third of the charge left in the power bank. I obviously haven't had a chance to review the footage yet, so you can be the judge of how good the video actually looks. So far, I'm really happy with what I'm getting out of the camera, but the battery life is fantastic. 
The ultra wide viewing angle I think is brilliant, especially in the times when I was standing up. Inside the cameras I've been using Samsung Evo Select 512 gigabyte memory cards, which I bought from Amazon, directly from Amazon. No third party sellers because I don't want to get any of that fake shite. And they too have been flawless. I've got four of them all together. But that means for the whole tour, seven days of video i didn't have to take any hard drives or a laptop or an ipad or anything with me on this trip again allowing me to keep everything minimal i've been recording in 2.7k though if i'd have been recording in 4k things might have been a bit different but then again i've been doing this long enough that i've got quite a stack of memory cards by now this magnetic clip thing that's on the cameras as well the thing that allows you to just clip it off of the mount is also fantastic because there's been a couple of times where i've had a different mount on the bike somewhere and instead of having to change the position of everything, I could just clip it off, clip it onto the other one, and carry on. Look at that, it's Arendelle. We pop in and see Anna and Elsa. See if we want to make me a nice cold cup of tea. And that pretty much wraps it up, I think, for the list of everything I've been using on this little adventure. If I've missed anything out, I do apologise, leave me a comment below, tell me what it is that I've missed out, and I will try and tell you as succinctly as possible, in text form, what I thought of it. Because even if I have forgotten something, to be honest, this video is already going to be monstrously long. I've been talking for hours and hours, so thank you so very, very much for keeping me company, keeping me distracted on this extended slog of a ride down to Christian Sand. But I did also say I was going to tell you anything that I've learned or any tips that I had. Uh, and to be honest, all I can really think of is check the weather before you leave for a day's riding. And if it looks like it's going to be cold, put your heated gear on before you start, because then you don't need to suddenly get changed in the porchway of a closed cafe with Gale Force 10 winds whipping around your testicles. Ask me how I know. And also, finally, ultimately, don't go to Norway in May hoping to do some off-roading everything will be shut so yeah that's pretty much it the adventure is about to come to an end 70 kilometers to go to my accommodation and then after that in the morning just a half an hour down to the ferry which is going to be slightly earlier than the crack of sparrow fart so not really worth anybody watching if you haven't already seen the tour series itself i implore you to go and check it out otherwise i hope that you found the information in this video useful interesting or at the very least a little bit entertaining. As always, any comments, queries or quandaries, bung them underneath in the comments and I'll do my very best to get back to you. And then after that, I'm just going to ride you out for these last few twisties. So get yourself comfy, maybe top up your tipple and let's see this adventure to the end. And then after that, I will see you in the next one. ta -ra! What an incredible roller coaster of a road to finish with. Right, I take it all back. The B line is getting f***ing sold. This horrendous piece of sh Just after I refueled, I clicked the reroute button when I was less than 10 kilometers away from my destination and it rerouted me with a 209 kilometer detour which i didn't realize until i pushed the button to see how long to my destination and it said 209 kilometers so strike three you're f***ing out my own private lane they got my memo then. Again, look at that. Red carpet laid out. Must want to get rid of me. Or well, they're sending me to a different boat. There is that possibility. I'm going to end up in a container. Beaten up and have my jelly baby stolen. Give us the sweet goods or the motorbike gets it.